Hello, students. Uh, so uh, we are going to be looking at a series of experiments that uh, have been done in the past. And these are classic experiments that show how plants respond to different growth signals, hormone signals, and environmental uh, conditions. So uh, as you watch the experiment, make sure you take note of what they did to the seedlings or what the hormone does and how they tested it. Plants don't have eyes and therefore cannot see, yet they are quite adept at sensing and responding to their environment, which they do through various kinds of tropisms, from the Greek tropos, meaning turn. The growth of a plant shoot toward light is called phototropism. This is how leaves get the sunlight they need for photosynthesis, and it's why house plants lean into the window. Shoots grow towards the light because of auxin, a plant hormone produced in the growing shoot tip. As one of its effects, auxin promotes cell elongation. When light hits one side of a plant shoot, auxin moves to the shaded side, creating a gradient of the hormone in the stem. The side receiving the most direct sunlight contains the least auxin, while the shaded side contains the most. Auxin promotes elongation of cells on the shady side of the stem. The elongation of cells on the shaded side points the stem toward the sun. Consider two other situations. In one, light strikes a plant from an overhead direction. In another, the tip of the shoot is covered and can't detect light. In both cases, auxin becomes... So I'm going to uh, pause the video now and I want you guys to discuss as a class what do you think will happen? Distributed equally on both sides of the plant. Both sides elongate equally and the tip grows straight up. Another tropism, called gravitropism, is the growth of plants in response to gravity. Roots grow downward with the force of gravity and shoots grow upward against it. So if you tip a plant over, it will right itself, again using the hormone auxin. In both the roots and stems, auxin becomes redistributed to the lower sides of the structure. However, root and stem cells have different responses to auxin. In the stem, the cells with more auxin elongate more, forcing stems to curve away from gravity. In root cells, cells with more auxin are inhibited from elongating. Cells on the side with less auxin elongate, forcing roots to bend in the direction of gravity. Because the different tissues respond in opposite ways to auxin, this single hormone signal allows plants to send shoots upward toward light and roots downward into soil. A plant has a sense of touch as vines dramatically show. This type of tropism is called thigmotropism. Touch sensitive growth is also controlled by auxin. Vine cells touching a pole get less auxin and consequently elongate less, while cells on the other side elongate more. The result is a kind of lopsided growth in the shoot, which causes the vine to coil around whatever it's touching. The old adage that one bad apple spoils a bunch is true, and its truth can be shown empirically. Put a ripe apple in a bowl of unripe ones, and the unripe neighbors will quickly ripen. That's because ripe fruit, apples and bananas especially, produce ethylene, a gaseous plant hormone, one effect of which is to promote ripening. If you put unripe bananas and a ripe apple in a confined space, such as a paper bag, the ethylene gas collects and causes the unripened fruit to start ripening. When fruits ripen, they lose chlorophyll and their cell walls begin to break down. The result is the conversion of a hard green fruit to a soft ripe one. Commercial fruit growers take advantage of the action of ethylene when they ship fruit to distributors. Often, fruit is picked before it is ripe to ensure it doesn't spoil as it travels long distances to market. Ethylene gas is pumped into ripening chambers to ripen fruit before it is placed on grocery store shelves. Certain plant hormones, such as those called gibberellins, regulate the growth and development of plants. Applying gibberellins to a young plant can increase the length of its stem, which also indirectly increases the size of its fruits, a fact that makes gibberellins very useful in agriculture. On an untreated seedless grape plant, the stem remains relatively short. 
so the bunches of grapes growing on the stem are clustered densely together, resulting in small grapes. When sprayed with gibberellins, the stems grow longer, giving the grapes more room to grow. Farmers spray seedless grapes with gibberellins because this growth-promoting hormone is normally produced in seeds, which these grapes lack. Gibberellin hormones are also required for seed germination. When conditions are right for seed to germinate, for example, when rising temperatures begin to melt frost, gibberellin levels increase and give the green light for a seedling to grow. In many species of plant, seed germination also depends on another hormone called abscisic acid, or ABA. ABA is the plant hormone that keeps seeds dormant over the cold winter months when conditions for growth are not ideal. With appropriate environmental cues, ABA is degraded, leading to the end of dormancy and the start of germination. Many animals, from insects to birds to humans, find plant parts tasty and irresistible. While plants rely on animals to eat their fruits and disperse their seeds, they also need to prevent animals from eating all of their leaves. Over the course of their evolution, plants have adapted in many ways to protect themselves. Some defenses are mechanical. For instance, the stems of a raspberry plant are covered in prickly spines to prevent unwanted chewing. Holly leaves are waxy and difficult for insect jaws to grasp. While a plant's fruits are often tasty and meant to be digested, seeds generally are not. The seed contains a new plant and therefore it must be protected. Many seeds are encased within an indigestible shell that prevents them from being destroyed by an animal's stomach juices. The unlucky animal that breaks open the shell and eats the seed is in for an unwelcome surprise. Seeds are sources of some of the most potent poisons on earth, including ricin, cyanide, and strychnine. Perhaps the most interesting method of deterrence that plants use is a kind of unwitting alliance. Some plants, such as wild tobacco, emit potent vapors when they are eaten by insect pests. The vapors in turn attract natural predators of the insects, which are thus enlisted in the plant's defense.